Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to service this morning and also all of our visitors and guests that are here and also the, those that are joining us with Facebook. Um, also like to have a special welcome to Pastor Tim. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, and then welcome to the Lord's Supper today. Um, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. All of you are invited. Um, we just ask that when you come up for communion, you come up the center aisle, you'll go off to each side, and then back to your pews down the side aisle. Some additional announcements for today is uh, we still have the VBS food donations going on. There's a sign-up sheet and table in the North X. You can also donate food and or make a monetary donation. Reminder uh, for our confirmation students, the 10th grade confirmation parent, student, and mentor meeting is this Wednesday, July 24th at 6.30 p.m. And also online bidding um, opens today uh, for the 2024 Green Lake uh, Ministries Quilt Auction, which will be held July 26th and 27th. Um, the Granite Falls Lutheran Church quilt, Bonnie's Beauty, was created by Bonnie Erickson and machine stitched by Audrey Borning. More information you can find on their website. And lastly, um, one correction to the calendar for the week. Expresso time is Thursday and it's at 2.30 rather than 3.30. That's printed in the bulletin. With that, that's it. I think it's your microphone. I, think it is. I shut mine off. I invite you to stand as you are able as we begin worship this morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and are given ourselves to the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent in your compassion. Forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead to sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power of the Holy Spirit and that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Our opening gathering hymn.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb that whose blood set us free to be people of God. Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us whole people, that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Today's lesson is a response of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He restores my soul, he leads me in right paths for his name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Here ends the lesson. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. Holy 
Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told them all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Now many saw them going and recognized him as they hurried on, the, on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land in a Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever he heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick at the marketplace and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all that touched were healed. The Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated and I invite the youth to come on up for kids time. I know there's a couple out there. Oh. Hey, welcome. Thanks for coming up, friends. This is awesome. Good morning. Good morning. All right. All right. We had just read the 23rd Psalm. Any of you, have you guys memorized the 23rd Psalm yet? No, I, have any of you memorized the 23rd Psalm? I'm thinking there will be hands up, or I'm guessing with a little bit of uh, coaxing, you can probably get 80 to 90% of it right. But this is an important Psalm for us, and, and today we're going to hear about a good shepherd. To help you think about the sermon, that's the words that are being spoken, the gospel that was read, and the 23rd Psalm, I have something I want you to do for me. And it's a real easy to, how to begin your focus on the 23rd. First off, I want you to put up your left hand. Thank you. <laughs> your left hand. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, that wasn't very nice. All right. How many fingers do you see up there? Five. Five. That's right. All right. Each finger is going to represent something from the 23rd Psalm. And it's quite amazing. It's only just the first statement that's made. We're going to start with a thumb. And this thumb represents the word the. The. This is the beginning. This is where it starts. The, the thumb is the word the. The second one with your pointer finger is the word is. No, you got it backwards. Is Lord. So, the and Lord, Lord. I want you to think, this finger points a lot, doesn't it? You know, it's like, you know, well, there's communion, there's my brother, there's why I lost my uh, ball. This finger, the, is the Lord, and it's going to help us point us to the Lord. The tall middle finger is the word is. And is allows us to be in the presence of the Lord. Is is kind of together in that case. The Lord, the Lord is. Okay, the next finger up is my. Now notice, mine is the, my, my wedding ring is on that one. It shows the love that I have, that my wife and I have. But it also reminds us of the love we have in God. So with my, it's kind of a possession. It's a thing we hold on to. This is my ball. This is my time with Grandma. The Lord is my, what do you think the last one's going to be? Shepherd. Shepherd. It's the last finger on your hand. It's also the smallest, but it does so much. It allows things to happen within your hand that you can be continued. It, it's a taskmaster. It makes sure all these other things work together. So there it is, the first five words of the 23rd Psalm. You've already memorized part of it. So say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. There, every time you put your hand out, you can think about that, and you have that with you forever. Shall we pray? Thank you. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for today. 
Thank you for being my shepherd. And thank you for being with us as we go forward. In your name we pray and play. Amen. Thank you very much. You guys can head back. Later on, we all get to hop out. Dear friends, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. It's always good for the pastor to start a sermon with, it's time for me to make a confession. It allows me to be honest with you. I watch cooking shows. Now, if my wife was here, she would say, first, that's not a confession. And that's possibly the biggest understatement that I have ever said in the recent times. I watch cooking shows. I watch a lot of cooking shows. Frankly, I watch every cooking show that I can. I watch because it allows me to experiment and how to learn to make new dishes. It kind of helps me with learning new skills as I move along, um, as I move along and try to provide food for uh, friends and family. Or it might be one of those cases where, yes, I think we do need a deep fryer in our kitchen, Sue. It's, it'll, be, it'll be a good addition to our house, really. Trust me, it'll be worth it. In fact, when we go on some vacations around, the, around Minnesota, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with the uh, TV show D Diners, Drives, and Zen Dives, and he goes to different places, we've found some of them, and we've gone. They don't disappoint. They are really good. But then there's the cooking shows, the cooking shows that are, that are competitions, like the, like the TV show Chopped, you may be familiar with it. It works this way. Chefs are brought in, they're given a, a, a basket. They don't know what's in the basket. They open it up and they find four ingredients that have nothing to do with each other. And in 20 minutes, the chef has to make a wonderful succulent meal, otherwise they're gonna get cut from the, from the competition. So they open their baskets and they go, well, what am I going to do with this stuff? Probably wondering why I'm bringing that imagery forward on today's gospel reading. Well, I, as I was prepping for the sermon, I kind of felt like I was living in that whole chopped scenario as I looked at this gospel and I started to unpack its basket of things for us to talk about, to hear this morning and how what God is asking us this morning. You look up and you wonder, what am I going to do? Who decided to put this together in such a way that's going to confuse someone who preaches? And quite literally, pastors say this all the time, there's got to be about a month's worth of sermons in here. Literally, there is about a month's worth of sermons in here. I don't know how far I want to take this because if this sermon isn't well, will I be chopped from, <laughs> from Granite Falls? I don't think so. But here goes. When I look at a gospel lesson or what I'm going to preach on, I kind of pick out the, what the major themes or the major patterns that, that, I want to be, that are being spoken to me this morning. And as I look at this one, I find at least five different things that I could preach on. First off, did you notice there's a 17-verse gap between the first part of that passage and the second part of that passage? When I was in seminary, they said, read those gaps, because sometimes there's a better sermon in the gap. This is also a weird transition time in, in, in Mark, because the, the disciples are coming back. You know, we're early in Mark, and they're coming back. What's up with that? What's up with that transitive healing property of Jesus's cloak or robe, just being, touching him brings help. And did you also notice that he called his disciples, but when they came back, he called them apostles? That's, that's different. And what does it mean, what does it mean to be, to be sheep without a shepherd? First, that gap. It's just a throwaway passage. Don't worry about it. It's only the feeding of the 5,000. And, and Jesus walking on water. So there's nothing there that I think needs to be preached on. Technically, it will be preached on in about three, four weeks. It gets picked up again. So uh, maybe that's not the focus the lectionary people wanted to have it. Or that transitive property. 
it's good to know that you can reach for Jesus in faith and be healed. Just the touch of his robe in faith, you'll be healed. It sounds like an oversimplification, but I think what it's saying to us this morning is that even in the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, healing can happen. And that little bit about the location in Mark. The disciples had just came back from being sent out by Jesus to go and to preach to the, on the countryside, to share the good news of his ministry here on earth. They were sent out, and when they came back, Jesus says, you guys are tired. Let's go do a retreat, and we will discuss what happened while you were out there. And they can't get there because they end up having to feed the 5,000. But there are two ingredients this morning that I would like to pick up for today's sermon. It starts in verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And Jesus wants to hear about that. How did that go for you? What's up with your time out there? And like I said, they were disciples, weren't they? Weren't they called? But now he's calling them apostles. Just to unpack that a little bit. A disciple is a follower of Christ. A dedicated follower. It's in the word disciple that you've heard this before. We get the word discipline. We are disciplined with Christ. But an apostle is one who is, spread, is a spreader of the faith. Now you can, and they're out there evangelizing is probably the phrase we would use today. One can be a disciple, but not necessarily an apostle. And I think an apostle is both. Well, here, let me give you a better vision of that. I think back to the days when I was an elementary special education teacher. Now, in that context, my faith could not be spoken, was spoken a little bit, but I led my life in such a way that let my students know that I cared for them and I nurtured them and I, and I wanted to be part of that. You know, while you're here, you're very important to me. No more was this more evident than the Sunday I was sitting in the choir loft and across the, the sanctuary was one of my current students. At first, I was a little miffed. You, no, 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 no. I got you from Monday to Friday for four, six and a half hours. You're not allowed to be in my space. This is my space this time. This is my time to recharge. And I got to tell you, from that point on, I don't remember the service at all. I just ruminated about that kid being in my space. And then about halfway through the worship service, the phrase in my head literally came, ah, oh, crap. He was there because his cousin was being baptized. And I went, he's there because his cousin's being... Pretty good chance he was baptized too. Pretty good that he had already been claimed and marked and sealed with the cross of Christ forever. My little precious student reminded me that we are all God's children and they needed my best. I needed to respect and care for him just as I would respect and care for my own children. But that's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. I flipped over to the apostle of Christ when I stepped out of teaching and went to seminary and became a pastor. That's pretty well self-evident here too. But that's the difference between a disciple and an apostle. But, and the final point this morning is what does it mean to be a sheep without a shepherd? Verse 34, as he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach many things. As I said with the kids, most of you know the 23rd Psalm. You have a pretty good working knowledge of it. In fact, this is the third time, including Lent, that the 23rd Psalm has been read in church. First, during Lent, as the shepherd headed towards his crucifixion. In Easter, the shepherd overcoming death and returning to his sheep. And now a shepherd that has compassion. That second point about Easter and the shepherd overcoming death. There's two outside passages I want to show you how Jesus modeled and, and presented himself as a shepherd before we'll, we'll look at length about the 23rd Psalm. In John 10, Jesus tells his disciples that, and he said it for about, no, about 15, 18 passages, he said it three or four times, 
I am the good shepherd. Doesn't want them to lose the fact that he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd comes through the gate and the good shepherd tends to his sheep and makes sure they're taken care of. The thief climbs in and steals. Or the hired hand doesn't know the sheep because the sheep know the shepherd. Fast forward later in John when the disciples are locked in that room. Jesus has died. There's de despair. There's grief. They don't know what their, their future looks like. They are some really sad, depressed sheep. And Jesus shows up into that locked room and he says one thing to them. Peace be with you. The sheep heard his voice and he was the gate that sent them on their message as they move forward. That's what the Good Shepherd does. I want you to go to the 23rd Psalm in your bulletin. And we'll look at that, and I want to look at it together as a deeper understanding of what I think this, gospel, this Psalm says to us. A lot of times when I start looking at a passage, I look at two things. I either look at the verbs, nouns, or pronouns. So nouns, pronouns are the same. The first three verses start with, The Lord is my shepherd. Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteous for his namesake. The voice in here is someone speaking about and proclaiming what does it mean to have that good shepherd. This is what the shepherd does. He does this. He leads me in the green pastures. He takes care of everything that is needed. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. And then it changes. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. The speaker of David, in this case, there's nothing he does. It's all done by that personal relationship. He went from a broadcast to a specific. You, you are that person. It's like the hymn, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, help me stand. I am weak. I need you, to Lord, to be with me. And then the final phrase, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, I've skipped a very important pronoun in all of this, and maybe you have caught it. It's the pronoun I. People don't think about this in terms of themselves. They think about what the shepherd does, but it does reflect back to who we are and, we, and the relationship and the compassion that we have with Christ. First one is, I shall not want. I had a colleague say, have you ever noticed that the hearse doesn't have a U-Haul behind it? That there's, you don't take it with you. As you talk to somebody who is nearing their end of their life, and you ask them to reflect, they don't reflect on, you know, I got a really nice car when I was 16. I miss my mom, I miss my dad. I miss those things that were very important, that have no intrinsic value, but they have fantastic value. And as you realize, as you walk in your life, that we're not in want. God provides for all that we have. House and home, clothing, family, work, protection. So I'm not in want because that shepherd cares about me and wants to make sure I am safe. Dropping down to verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, there's no off-ramp. We walk that darkest valley. We walk it with friends and, and, and family that hold our hands and take us through that time. There's no promise. Just because Jesus died doesn't mean that we get to sidestep that. And we get to walk beyond it. Oh, that's not me. That's for somebody else. We get to walk it because I will fear no evil. I think I can say that I would probably fear evil. I walk through a cancer diagnosis. I get that feeling. But then I'm reminded that the shepherd 
Didn't the shepherd walk this valley? Didn't they walk to the cross? Didn't the shepherd go through that time in his life and where he said, let me take, take my hand. I have been there. I have done this. I have gone through the darkest valley and I know that there is something else coming for you. I shall not want. I will walk through the darkest uh, valley and I will fear no evil because you are with me. And then it falls to verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And here's the promise, folks. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what it means to have a shepherd who cares for us, who went to the cross. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that you will, when you arrive, I will say, thank you, faithful, good servant. Let me show you the place I have. I will show you the house of the Lord forever. But I want to keep this in mind for us today, that that is our end game, and we know we have that promise. But this is also the house of the Lord. This is our temporal house. This is where we gather to hear his name, to hear his proclamation, to fortify us as we go forward in our lives, as we go forward, to celebrate, to sing, to praise, to do all those things. You know, and it doesn't matter if you're the biggest mega church in the world. If Christ is present, it is the house of the Lord. I've been in ER bays when it's the darkest time. And I'm reminded that Christ's promise of wherever one or two people are gathered in my name, that becomes the house of the Lord. This is not, we have this temporal place, but we have constant places to remind us that we are with Jesus, that Jesus is with us, the shepherd is by us, carrying us through these dark times, celebrating with us in our, in our, in our great times, that the shepherd doesn't ever leave us. He protects, he serves, and we shall not be in want. So we give thanks to God for that shepherd that comes into our life to prepare us and to call us home. Amen. I invite you to stand as you're able as we continue with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Spirit, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was there. One in the communion of saints in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. Before the Church of Jesus Christ in this and every land, through one, through the one who is the cornerstone of a firm foundation, join us together and build us up as a temple of mercy and peace. Nurture the faith of young people as they return home from the National Youth Gathering and with their new experiences. Break down the dividing walls and inspire collaboration among people of every age. In your mercy. For the world, where peace seems far off, bring it near. Where justice seems fleeting, bring it to light. Where discord seems relentless, bring harmony. In your mercy. For the health and well-being of family, friends, neighbors, heal those who are sick. We remember especially Mary and Scott and Tim, Yvonne, Nancy, Di, Butch, Betty, Marlene, Terry, Rochelle, Harland, and any of those whom we name silently in our hearts at this time. Give courage to all who struggle with addiction. Touch with your tender care all who reach out to you in pain. In your mercy. For this assembly and for our call committee, continue to give us hope and inspiration for a settled pastor. Guide us to accepting being leaders for proclaiming you in this community. In your mercy. In thanksgiving for those who have died, make us certain that in Christ we are no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints in the household of God. In your mercy. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, the life, the shepherd, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you all. Take a few moments and let's share that peace with one another. Okay, great. You may be seated. We'll receive our offering at this time.
Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your, with your very self and called us to be the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we are received here, your body for life of this world. Amen. I invite you to please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with all the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. So often as we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until his return. And together we proudly pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The table is set. All are welcome. You may be seated, and I invite the communion assistants to please come forward.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from you your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with our, your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite the congregation to stand. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you grace. May he look upon you with his countenance in his name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn.